Okay, so this afternoon I'm going to talk about alternative approaches to valuing health outcomes. And I think it's important, these are interesting, but it's important to emphasise that far and away the dominant approach currently is using qualies. It's, it's really the way, way more popular and widely used. Um, this woman, I would like to say I met her in Berlin, but I, 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 I didn't. But uh, I was walking past a bus shelter or something. I think it was a bus shelter in, in Berlin. And um, I was struck by the messaging. Shop <laughs> shopping is better than a psychiatrist. Um, and it sort of put me in mind that, um, you know, qualies were measuring something really quite specific. We're defining health in terms of some particular description, maybe Q5D, and we're focusing on mobility and things like that. But actually, maybe there's some wider concept out there that's rather more important. And this just put it in mind for me. It also made me think of my daughter, um, not so much the appearance, but the message. I think uh, she, she's a very, I think she gets good therapeutic value from shopping activity, particularly when I'm paying. Right. So. Oh. The um, dominant approach qualies, but let's leave them aside just now. Let's now concentrate on two other approaches. One has been, um, in a way, an obvious approach from an economic perspective, and that is to use money to value health outcomes. And the second approach, less obvious perhaps from an economic perspective, but uh, quite popular in recent years, and some of the researchers have been economists, uh, looking at well-being and life satisfaction. So let's work through these two. Now, first of all, monetary valuation of health benefits. There are a number of reasons why you might want to investigate mon monetary valuation. And most of these reasons are to do with the limitations of existing cost effectiveness measures. One challenge with other measures of cost effectiveness, things like cost per quality, cost per life year gained, cost per fracture prevented, cost per disease-free year, you name it. All of these measures have, have a particular challenge associated with them. And that is, how much should we be willing to spend to get the benefit? How much should we be willing to spend to avoid a fracture or to avoid a stroke? Or how much should we be willing to spend to gain a life year or gain a quality. Now, if you do things in money terms, you're there already. You, you've got the money valuation. So that's one reason. Another um, argument for looking at broader forms of valuation, such as monetary valuation, is that typically health services produce benefits other than just changes in health. And the quality might be, might be quite good at measuring the change in health, but what about these other benefits? Can it capture the other benefits? And arguably it can't. So it focuses purely on the health part. If we take a monetary valuation approach, in principle, it should be able to value a wider range of benefits. And the final argument why we might want to think of embracing monetary valuation as an approach is that for some purposes, we want to make judgments about the benefits we can get from health investments as compared to the benefits we can get outside the health sector, uh, investing more in education or investing more in um, environmental protection, or investing more in transportation infrastructure. 
Now, again, the quality is not very helpful. If we're looking just at health, maybe the quality is all right. But once we start looking at other sectors, uh, there's a very clear limitation of the quality. So there are basically three approaches to monetary valuation. Uh, first one I'll look at briefly is described as the human capital approach. Then the second one, equally briefly, I'll look at is revealed preferences. That's studying actual behavior. And the final one, which I'll spend a bit more time on, are stated preferences, where you're giving people hypothetical choices and asking them to value something. So you're not observing the value, the behavior, uh, but you're asking them, how do you value, how highly do you value something? Okay, human capital approach. It's actually got a very long history. You can find some works that have essentially espoused a human capital approach many, many years ago. Essentially, the human capital approach is focusing on changes in productivity. So it's looking at individuals as if they're machines. And if the machine is broken, it doesn't produce. If we repair the machine, it produces. If the human being is broken, we mend them. Um, doctors, there's other ways of mending. There's, we were discussing yoga at lunch. There's spiritual approaches, but medicine could be seen as mending the human machine. And one consequence of mending the human machine is they become more productive. And so, could we not value the health gain that we've achieved in terms of that increased productivity? That's the sort of simple, or you could even say simple-minded, um, approach. In some ways, it's slightly distasteful thinking of individuals as, as machines. But, it's not a very big but, you can see some argument that one of the benefits of a healthier population is that they will be more productive and we will make, as a, as a society, we'll make better use of our scarce resources. So it's, it's not at first sight very appealing, but it's not without some grain of um, insight, I guess. It's easy to describe it as we will measure the health benefit by the change in productivity. In practice, it's slightly harder to implement. Measuring productivity and changes in productivity is not as straightforward as you might first think. One reason is that frequently we work in groups. We work in teams. And identifying one individual's contribution is quite difficult. If you think of a world of sort of artisans producing objects which they then sell, the healthier cobbler makes an extra pair of shoes per day. He or she can sell that pair of shoes and get some money. And so if we can get the cobbler healthier, we can see a direct link to selling more shoes and more money. But that's not really how the economy works for, for many people, or at least in developed economies. I guess in societies that are still predominantly agrarian, there might be a more direct link. But even then, I'm not very sure. We do so many activities as humans together, it's really quite difficult to separate out the contribution of one individual. I know it's really difficult to think what my productivity is. I haven't a clue. How would I go about measuring it? Now, no, I wouldn't even speculate. I hope it's positive. <laughs> so that's, that's one challenge. Um, but it's more difficult than that. Even if we can measure people's productivity, we need to do more than that. We need to be able 
to attribute changes in productivity to the changes in health. And that's, that link is also perhaps not always straightforward. So there's some measurement challenges, but of course there's more fundamental problems here, and that is we don't just value improvements in health because of the change in productivity. If we did, all these elderly patients, why, why bother? Um, Actually, maybe in Japan differently, because I look around and I see some quite old people apparently engaged in productive activity. I don't know. But, but, it, but actually, more broadly, we, we don't just value improvements in health because it changes productivity. We are maybe glad the improved health improves productivity, but we, that's not the only source of value. And the final criticism is that if you really did embrace the human capital approach, it has undesirable consequences for groups who are already disadvantaged because it's using the marketplace to judge value. And of course, the marketplace is full of discrimination and um, every society, women, for example, are paid less than men for doing the same job. Probably every society has some ethnic groups it discriminates against. And, uh, well, age, we probably have, in most societies, age discrimination of one form or another. And so if you're going to judge people's value by what they produce, and you've got an unfair society that makes it hard for some people, some people's production to be valued appropriately, you're just adding to your problems. So I would not recommend the human capital approach, but it exists and has been in the past uh, occasionally used. And as I say, there is a grain of validity in it that one aspect of health improvement that we might sometimes value is the change in people's productivity. So what about an alternative? Well, one alternative is a revealed preferences approach. And this is particularly liked or favored by economists. Economists maybe are cynical. I would say it's more realism than cynicism. But economists think that people reveal their true preferences in their behavior. It's what we do that speaks about our preferences. Um, this is, in English, sometimes summarized as an aphorism, actions speak louder than words. And I'm sure virtually every country probably has a similar saying. If you ask somebody how they value something, there's all sorts of possibilities they may misrepresent their true value. Whereas if you observe the choices somebody makes, it's far more revealing about their preferences. Now that principle doesn't seem too bad. It's probably quite a good way of finding out about people's values. The challenge, however, is to do it in practice. Because in practice, all sorts of factors influence behavior. And only part of that behavior is being driven by differences in people's preferences. We do have various techniques that have been developed. There's something called um, hedonic pricing. Uh, the idea here is that the overall price of a good or a service is based on uh, the, the individual attributes or elements the good pr provides. The easiest way to describe this might be an example. Uh, if you rent or indeed buy a house somewhere to live, the amount of rent you pay or the amount you have to pay to buy the house will depend on things like the age of the property. 
It'll depend on how many rooms it has. It'll be influenced by its location. Uh, location might be important because of closeness to um, shopping or educational opportunities or closeness to transportation opportunities. Uh, indeed, it might be the location also has an influence on things like uh, noise levels, uh, has influence on air pollution and things like that. So there's lots of different characteristics. And so the hedonic pricing approach recognizes this and tries to explain the rental price or the purchase price in terms of the characteristics. And one way of using this in the health context and has been used is to see how much people value clean air. Uh, because if you have cleaner air, you have fewer respiratory problems. And it's getting quite a tenuous link, but we're going from the, the rental price, um, linking it to the characteristics of the location, part of which are environmental, and we're getting a link between people's willingness to pay more for a better environment. And then, having got that link, you can look at differences in rates of respiratory conditions between areas and make a final jump or link um, where you say, well, therefore, people, the amount of people are willing to pay for accommodation and paying more for clean air translates into willingness to pay this amount additional to have fewer respiratory problems. But it's all a bit tenuous. Another method is called the travel cost method. This comes directly from uh, environmental economics literature, where we have, a bit like health, we have difficulty valuing environmental goods. And uh, one approach has been to see what costs people are willing to incur in terms of travel in order to visit sites that have particular uh, environmental properties. And um, it's, that approach has been used. Not very easy to use in a health context, but there are some examples where individuals trade off money and risk to their health. Uh, the idea here is, and it's back to hedonic pricing, that uh, other things equal, being equal, a job that's riskier will have to pay more money to compensate individuals for accepting that higher risk. And if you can identify that risk money payment relationship, this gives you an opportunity to say how much people are willing to pay in order to have less uh, health risk. Uh, it does fall down a little bit that, um, for example, in the United States, it used to be, this is before smoking restrictions, what the, one of the riskiest occupations was bartender. And they had a very high risk, mainly because of the smoke they were inhaling, courtesy of their customers. Probably also high risk because of their access to alcohol led to higher consumption. And no doubt, they're also sometimes exposed to more violence and things like that. But of course, bartenders are not particularly highly paid. And so it seems a little bit implausible that we can get establish a relationship between um, high risk and then higher payment because this occupational group were the highest risk but among the lowest paid. Uh, but you can see the principle. And uh, certainly there have been numerous studies which have established some sort of trade-off between the salary paid and the riskiness of the occupation. And that can then be translated into what are called willingness to pay um, to, to, uh, for statistical life. Um, but it's kind of fringe activity. It's interesting for academic economists to do, write quite interesting papers, but it's not really telling us much about how we value health. Question? Yes? But isn't that exactly what people do, the so-called health economists, when they uh, talk about the uh, uh, economic loss due to depression, due to 
absenteeism and presenteeism they value the Well, actually, what, what we do there is, is um, echoes of human capital. Uh, we, we say that, uh, you know, such and such a proportion of the population are all absent from work um, because of, say, depression. And uh, if they didn't have depression, we assume they would be at work and then we can look at how much they're paid and we can sort of gross it up. And, and so it does produce, it produces these figures of, you know, it costs the economy X trillion per year. Um, it's not re well, it's, it's not really health economics, it's advocacy. It's people saying, look, this is an area that we should pay more attention to and here's some big numbers to, to justify why we should pay more attention to it. Um, burden of disease, cost of illness studies, tell us rather little that helps decision making. Uh, the essence of decision making is identifying changes we could make and then considering, compared to what we do now, this change, uh, what will it cost us and what benefits will arrive or can be expected? And uh, that's what, where economics is having some value. Now, figures about what it costs the economy per year because of depression don't tell us that. They don't give us any insight into the um, additional benefit we can get if we do things differently, if we organize our services differently, if we um, change the health technology we're utilizing. Yes and no, in the sense that if you have uh, uh, let's say, the results of a trial that shows treating everyone with depression mm -hmm. brings back the productivity to a certain level, then you can calculate that by treating all these people with depression in the workplace, the productivity will, the loss due to lost productivity <coughs> will be reduced by oh, whatever yeah. amount. I'm not disagreeing. We can certainly do that. But these studies that sort of gross up the costs and say, look, depression or diabetes or dementia, they don't have to begin with D, it just comes out better. They're costing us this amount. That sort of study is really just trying to attract attention. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's not really what these methods are for. And what these methods are for is the example you just gave, that yes, we've got some evidence that this intervention works. This is the magnitude of the, the effect. Let's now consider how much benefit that's producing and how much it's costing us to achieve it. Because then we can make a, a much more informed judgment if, if, if this is a good development. But um, revealed preferences is not going to give us this value. Basically, there's just too much going on affecting people's behavior for us to reasonably isolate that part which tells us people's willingness to pay for a health benefit. So, Although it might be appealing, we, we get driven away from revealed preference and we get driven towards stated preferences. Now, immediately, we've got potential difficulties. You're asking people, so essentially, what value do you place on this outcome? And immediately, there's many potential sources of bias. Uh, we've looked at some stated preference approach already today, um, time trade-off is a stated preference approach. We're giving people a hypothetical choice. Remain in this particular health state for 10 years or move to a better health state, but for a shorter time. Stated preference. Now, a particular area of stated preference has, has the, again, so much jargon, but has the jargon of contingent valuation. And Essentially, the, the term contingent valuation comes from the idea that usually we have markets and we can observe in the market what people are paying for particular goods or services. In health, we don't really have a market. You don't go out and buy yourself some health. Uh, it would be a nice idea if we could. 
Uh, who would then, you know, the government could wither away almost, or they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to worry about health care. I'm facetious. There would still be some issues about fairness, but, um, but we don't, we don't have markets for health. We have markets for health care to a limited extent, but most of them are highly regulated and thus somewhat distorted. So the idea with the stated preference is contingent on there being a market, how would you value this outcome? That's where the contingent bit comes. But we don't actually have any markets where you can buy a sort of a healthy heart or buy the absence of diabetes. And the most common contingent valuation method or set of methods come under the label or heading willingness to pay. And so I want to look particularly at willingness to pay approaches. Now, I could give you the economic theory, but that would really be not the thing to do. But um, it's very simple what's going on. Economists want to compare life without the change with a change. And um, we could be in some initial position. Uh, these are called indifference curves. Um, these measure combinations of goods that give us the same value. And so different combinations of X and Y give us particular value. If we had more income, we could buy bigger combinations and get more benefit. And so the whole issue here of willingness to pay is comparing our starting point with some end point. And in this case, it's, we've just changed a price and that's the change, but it could be any sort of change. Comparing the starting point with the end point, we want to know how much better off we are at, after the change. Um, we want to know what's the distance between these two curves. And uh, there's two approaches here. One way we ask a question and say, look, if we make this change that makes you better off, how much money can we take away from you so that you're just as well off as you were originally? I'll repeat that because it sounds a bit like a, a tongue twister almost. Think of this change that makes you better off. Now, if we are willing to make this change for you, how much money can we take from you so that in the new situation, you'd be as well off as you were originally? And that's um, one way of looking at willingness to pay. The second is just a related thing. And then in this case, we're saying, if we don't give you the change, you know, if we don't give you the treatment, how much money would we have to give you to make you as well off as if you had got the treatment? Because if you'd had this change, um, if you'd been made better off, you're at a higher level of well-being. If we don't make any change, if we don't treat you, but instead give you money, how much money would we have to give you? This would put a lot of doctors and nurses out of business if we did do this. Because instead of trying to fix people's health problems, we would just say, look, you've got this health problem. Um, how much money would make you feel as happy as if we got rid of the health problem? You could shut hospitals. You'd, you'd have to, but uh, yeah. Now, um, that, there is not, so there's some underlying theory there, but it, don't worry about it. But we've got two choices here. We either consider where, where people are now, or we consider the new position, the, the better position. And if, if we consider the where they are now, we're then saying, well, how much money can we take away from you and leave you as well off as you are now? Or if we consider the new position, the better position, we're saying, how much money would we have to give you to make you better off without actually doing the treatment. So that's willingness to pay. So there's various attempts um, to elicit people's willingness to pay, or indeed their maximum willingness to pay. There's open-ended questions, there's payment cards, there's dichotomous choice. This is sometimes referred to as take it or leave it. 
Uh, there's dichotomous choice with follow-up, and there's something called bidding games. Um, these are probably best explained with some examples. So first of all, here's a payment card. Uh, this is an example from a Norwegian study, hence NOC, uh, Norwegian Krona. And with a payment card, you simply uh, present individuals with a list of values, and then you ask a question. You're trying to identify what's the maximum amount they'd be willing to pay for something. So you have to describe the, the something that you're, that's on offer. And then in this particular study, uh, they asked individuals to put a tick if they were definitely willing to pay that amount, put a cross if they definitely wouldn't pay it, and then circle the amount which they felt was the maximum they would pay. Uh, so that's a payment card approach. Uh, here's an example of a dichotomous choice with an open-ended follow-up. Um, a little bit of text. So you have, to, you have to describe the thing that's on offer. In this particular case, it's something called COS, Controlled Ovarian Stimulation. So imagine the hypothetical situation in which your physician offers you a COS treatment that compared with another available COS treatment has the following characteristics. So the offer is that this, uh, this method will give you something better than your current method. Uh, a one to 2% gain in the probability of a successful pregnancy. Uh, the technology is being presented as a pre-filled pen that makes administration of treatment easier, more comfortable, safer, quicker, and more discreet. You can see there's a marketing campaign going on here. Um, 50%, a reduced or 50% smaller chance of redness or discomfort at the injection site, so on. Safer in terms of smaller risks of causing allergy or infection. And so um, the question, and this is the dichotomous choice question, given a, a cost treatment option with these characteristics, you know, that is this much better than the current treatment, um, would you be willing to pay 12,000, sorry, 1,200 euros per cycle? So it's dichotomous choice in the sense it's a yes, no. Would you be willing to pay this amount? Uh, yes or no. So dichotomous choice. And then depending on the respondent's answer, if they were asked yes, um, or if they answered yes, they're then asked, so what's the maximum you'd be willing to pay for a product with these characteristics? If they'd responded no, again, they're asked, so what's the maximum you would be willing to pay? And that's an open-ended question. Typically, open-ended questions are very hard to answer. Open-ended willingness to pay questions. Dichotomous choice are generally thought much easier, partly because dichotomous choice is a bit like real life. Um, real life, we go into the supermarket and there's a particular price on different goods. And we reach out and take it and then pay for it, or we don't pay for it. So it's a dichotomous choice. Another example, and I have to own up here, this is by Dong et al, and I'm, I'm part of et al. Uh, this was an interesting collaboration. We, we, we were looking at willingness to pay for community-based health insurance in uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Burkina Faso is um, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's uh, a little bit west of uh, Nigeria, a bit east of, no, a bit north of Ghana, and a bit south of Mali. It's sort of, you, I don't want to be unfair to people from Burkina Faso, but if you're looking for the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it's probably in the middle of nowhere. Um, as with many low-income countries, there's a huge challenge getting enough resources into the health sector. So somebody had the bright idea, let's see if we could sell them, maybe not sell them, if we could um, interest them in community-based health insurance. And so as one strand of this research program, uh, they wanted to do a willingness to pay study mm. for com community-based health insurance. Uh, 
the research group was centered at the um, University of Heidelberg in Germany, but the lead researcher on this was Hen Jing Dong from China. And then me, <laughs> they asked for some advice about willingness to pay. Um, so um, this is an example of um, ultimately what might call a bidding game, or also take it or leave it study. So they, uh, we interviewed, or we, the research team interviewed, uh, 1,100 adults, and they were randomly assigned a starting price. Uh, mm. the, the, the package, the community-based health insurance, was described to them, what was involved, what benefits would be uh, available. And then these 1,100 adults were assigned randomly a starting price between 2,000 and 8,000 franc CFA, which is equivalent to about 3 to 12 euros, which I think is about, is that about 300 yen to 1,200 yen? Okay, we're in that sort of zone. Now, if um, the individual said yes to the first price, they um, were then offered a higher price. If they said no to the first price, they were then offered a lower price. And you went on offering them higher or lower prices until, as it were, they, they flipped. So if they kept saying yes, you kept raising the amount, and then once they said no, you stopped. Or if they kept saying no, you kept lowering the amount until they said yes. It's a sort of torture. It's called a bidding game, but it's not much fun. Um, but this does provide two values. It provides the first answer, the yes or no, it's a dichotomous choice, or take it or leave it valuation. And it provides the final answer, to the, so it's the bidding game estimate. Okay. Right. Now, clearly there's going to be some issues concerning the measurement of willingness to pay. I've just briefly introduced the different methods. One problem that's been observed is something called sub-additivity effects. People's willingness to pay for some service or good A, plus their willingness to pay for some good or service B, typically is greater than their willingness to pay for A and B together. Now that's slightly unfortunate because it kind of means the way you ask the questions is going to influence the answer you get, as of course, it's not surprising. Similarly, there's been observed sequence effects. If you ask people their willingness to pay for A, followed by willingness to pay for B, you may get different answers than if you ask them about willingness to pay for B, followed by willingness to pay for A. Again, a bit unfortunate from a measurement point of view. But probably the biggest problem is something described as scope insensitivity. And that is um, people's willingness to pay is frequently rather insensitive to the magnitude of the outcome. Um, where this was first observed was actually in environmental economics where um, People were asked how much they might be willing to pay to you know, protect breeding sites for some rare species. And so, you know, if you, how much are you willing to pay to ensure that you know, 50 breeding pairs, or whatever animal or bird we're thinking of, um, were protected? And then if you ask them how much are you willing to pay if 50,000 breeding pairs were protected, their willingness to pay often hardly increased. Now, that may well be a true reflection of their preferences, or it might just be, yes, there's a true reflection of this insensitivity. 
They do genuinely value one more than another, but when they give their answers, the difference seems very small. And this has also been observed to some extent in the health context. Um, this was a study um, done in Denmark. Uh, and it was looking at willingness to pay for um, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so there was um, the first option, CV1, was reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease from two out of a thousand to one out of a thousand over a period of 10 years. And this was restated to the individual as this would avoid uh, our friend EQ5D, this would avoid this health state, um, two, 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 two. And that's some problems, mobility, some problems with youth activities, some problems, self-care, um, moderately anxious or depressed and uh, with some moderate discomfort. So that's the, the first program. It will lead to that benefit. The second program, CV2, again reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease uh, from two out of a thousand to one out of a thousand um, over a period of 10 years, but it avoided death. So in one case, you haven't changed the risk of death, but you've changed the, the, the risk of, of a particular ill health outcome. But in the second one, it was described in terms of changing the risk of death. And so what they used was a dichotomous choice question, and also they followed that with a payment card question. And what they found was rather interesting. Um, it's <coughs> Danish kroner. Ooh. I'm not sure. I, I want to say about 10 yen to the krona, but I'm, I'm not a currency expert. Uh, so what they found, so first of all, there's two dichotomous choice and then payment card. If we look first of all at dichotomous choice data, the mean willingness to pay implied by people's dichotomous choices was about 7,000 krona for the first program, uh, about just over 9,000 krona for the second program. If we look at their mean willingness to pay using the payment card method, it was about half as much. So that's one problem, one method giving different values, but uh, about 3,200 krona for the first pr program, CV1, slightly over 4,000 krona for CV2. Now, the um, ratio of qualities that are being gained between the two programs was calculated as about 2.22. In other words, this second program was saving or generating, depends how you want to look at it, about twice as much, slightly more than twice as many qualities. Uh, but if we look at the ratio of these willingness to pay, they're not 2.222. On the payment cards, it was 1.26. On the dichotomous choice, it was 1.32. So there's a degree of insensitivity there. We would rather hope, perhaps, if our methods were robust, that um, these values in the bottom line would be at least twice as much as the top line. And, and they're not. But it's worse than that. <laughs> they then looked at the individual valuations of uh, the two programs, and they found that 68% of the respondents value, gave the same willingness to pay. Now remember, one program is producing twice, more than twice the benefit of another program, but 68% gave exactly the same willingness to pay. 26.6% at least got it in the right direction. They had a willingness to pay for CV1, which was less than CV2. And 
5% didn't even get the direction right. 5% valued CV1 more highly than CV2. Is this a problem with logic or non-communication? Um, I, well, or scope insensitivity. But I mean, the bottom bit is more than scope insensitivity. It's sort of just getting things wrong. Um, I think it's reflecting that these are unfamiliar questions and they're not easy to think about and to answer. We are used to going into the supermarket and making a decision, oh, that cake looks very nice. Oh, but it's costing, am I willing to pay? Or that bit of beef or something looks great, but am I willing to pay that amount? We're quite used to that, but we're maybe not used to um, this health program will reduce these risks and produce this benefit. This program will have a different set of characteristics. How much am I willing to pay? So it's unfamiliarity partly, but of course that's always going to be a problem in the health context. Um, now, I, uh, as I noticed sort of or mentioned in passing, <laughs> the payment card produced rather different results from the dichotomous choice. And uh, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that different methods give different answers. And it's partly because there are different potential biases with different methods. Now, the payment card is particularly subject to what's called midpoint bias um, and something sometimes called range bias. Midpoint bias is the, the description given to the phenomenon that individuals feel much more comfortable picking a value near the middle. They really don't, most individuals, really don't like going to the extremes. Now, one can understand that. Um, I've noticed it, uh, particularly in Japanese society, on um, subway trains. If there's a choice of where to sit down, a Japanese person almost always, this is not midpoint bias, it's the opposite, they will sit in a corner seat. So there's a bench, they'll sit in one of the corners. They just about never sit in the middle. Well, it's the same thing going on here, but let's flip it. Um, starting point bias. Um, <coughs> clearly, starting point bias is a problem. Uh, in the Burkina Faso experiment, because we randomized the starting points, we were able to test it. And we did find starting point bias. So if you started with a low bid, a low value, you ended up at a relatively low value. If you started at a high value, you ended up at a relatively high value. Because of course, people don't want to keep saying yes, 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 or no, no. They learn that the only way to stop the questions is to change the answer. And so um, definitely that does happen, particularly in bidding games. Take it or leave it, or if you uh, like um, dichotomous choice, it's a more formal name for it, is subject to something called yes yeah saying. And this is a phenomenon where individuals, again, I don't want to generalize, but most individuals would rather just say yes. I've often used this as an experiment. I then turn to somebody in the front row and say, um, shall we go for coffee after the lecture? And most of the time, the person will go, Yes. Sometimes you get a vociferous sort of no and a sort of alarm. <laughs> but so I won't do it today. Um, but if you ask somebody something in a polite way and a, you, you know, your body language is sort of right, chances are they're going to say yes. Uh, I mean, it's that's just the way people are, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, that's my, that might make life go a bit easier. You know, we're not always rough edges rubbing up against each other. But it doesn't help when you do your willingness to pay study. You want to know what people genuinely feel, what their valuation really is. And if there's yes saying going on, you're going to get uh, a misleading um, answer. 
final one on this list, strategic bias. This describes a situation where people think they can change the outcome through their answer. Uh, for example, in the community-based health insurance, people might think, well, look, if I really give my true value, I might have to pay this. Whereas if I come in low with a low valuation, it's less likely that I'll have to pay so much as possible. Or, or people might think the other way. They might think that um, if I value this, give quite a low valuation, it may never be on offer. But if I give a high valuation, they may bring it in. So this, there's these things. And th again, this has been tested. There's a very famous, um, now, a very famous study in Swedish to do with comedy programs, but that takes me too far away. I, I better not go there. Um, but so st people answer strategically sometimes. There's other problems, reliability and um, validity. Let's take reliability first. We're getting these answers from people, but, but how reliable are they? You know, if, if we get a valuation today and then ask the same person the same question in the future, will we get the same answer or, or remotely the same answer? Well, this is another thing that we um, explored in uh, Burkina Faso study. Uh, we asked them the same question, the same people, twice. And what we found was sort of okay, but not great for reliability. The measure of reliability being used here, something called Kappa score, um, 0.5 39, 0.467, 0 0.554, 0 0.621. These are typically seen as um, moderate, 0.41 to 0.6, good agreement, 0 0.6 to, to 0 0.8. So it's moderate to good agreement. So people's, um, essentially, those who are giving quite high values first time we asked them, we're giving quite high values second time. Those who are giving low values first time, we're tending to give low values second time. So there's some reliability. But what was interesting was the mean willingness to pay was about 25% lower when we went back the second time. Now, the second time when we went back, so I say we, it's a search team, I've, I've been to Ghana, but I've never been to Burkina Faso, so I, I didn't quite make it there. Um, the team went back four to five weeks later. And our ex post explanation is that it's a rural area and um, people's wealth is kind of wrapped up in their crops and food stores not so much in things like money or possessions. Our thinking was four to five weeks later, your food stocks were four to five weeks lower. Mm -hmm. And so you actually felt uh, poorer. And that might be why willingness to pay came down. Although coming down 25% in four to five weeks is a bit, um, a bit of a large gap. So maybe a concern there. Um, about something going on. So that's reliability. Uh, let's go back to validity. <coughs> so validity, um, the, the question here is, we've got these numbers from people, we've got these values. Are the responses actually people's maximum willingness to pay? And um, that's how we're interpreting them, but are they? Uh, and To the extent that um, this has been tested, people have then tried to ask, are these willingness to pay a good guide to subsequent behavior? So it's a bit like there are stated preferences. Let's now think about revealed preferences. So are they a good guide to subsequent behavior? And um, there's a few studies that have looked at this, very few. And this is a study um, by Onwujukwe. Um, a Nigerian health economist, 
and quite an old study, but there's really so few of these studies about. Um, and what he had done was he'd done a Williams to Pay study uh, for insecticide treated bed nets. Uh, it was in southeast Nigeria. And within one or two months of asking people how much they're willing to pay and would they be willing to pay for insecticide treated bed nets, he went back and gave people the actual opportunity to pay the money uh, and purchase the nets. And what he found was the willingness to pay um, statements, this is the response to the hypothetical um, option, predicted 80% of subsequent decisions. So the only ones that were wrong were these 40, or wrong, um, were inconsistent. And so um, on the diagonal, these are people who, the upper diagonal here, 128, they, they gave a hypothetical yes, and they actually did pay it subsequently. Down here, we had 32 people who, to the hypothetical question, said no, and subsequently didn't purchase. It's this, this group here with the 40, or 20% of them, who had said yes, but then said no. Bias. Could be, yeah, it could be uh, seeing bias. Um, it could be people's circumstances had changed in the interim, you know, some of them, but, um, you know, none of these people's circumstances change. You know, circumstances change for the better sometimes, you know, they're not, it's not always the worse. Uh, but there are very few studies of this type. Um, actually, I had a, another student from Thailand. Sounds like a good recommendation for Thai students. Um, and he was a public health, or dental public health, I um, don't know what you call them, dental public health person. And uh, he did a willingness to pay study in um, Thailand. And he was particularly interested in uh, health, dental health insurance for children. And the first time I heard that, I immediately had the idea he was trying to sell dental health to children but it, obviously it's the parents and it's a health program for children because particularly in Thailand there's major major problems of dental health in young children um, effectively dietary uh, led or stimulated and so what he'd done was a willingness to pay study and then go back and give people the actual opportunity to buy the plan and uh, it was a very interesting study, and basically he found that the willingness to pay could only be relied on when people said they were fairly sure about their answer. So he did the willingness to pay study, he then asked them, how sure are you about your answer? You know, very sure, or yes, I'm pretty sure, not too sure, oh, I really don't know. And so he found that those people who'd said, yeah, look, I'm, I'm fairly sure about my answer, for them, the willingness to pay predicted quite well. Um, but as I say, there's not very many studies of this type about, partly because they're quite difficult to do in a health context, and partly, well, there's ethical issues sometimes. Um, what he actually had to do to get around the ethical problem was once he then got gone back and sold them it and got the money, he then went back again, gave them money back and said, and by the way, I've organized it so you can have the dental health for free for a year. And so, no, you know, nobody was hurt in the making of this research. Um, but you can see the ethical challenges in doing research of this type. So to summarize that, we don't have much evidence about validity, but some evidence we've got is supportive. Uh, we have a bit more evidence on reliability, but again, the evidence is sort of in the middle. You know, there are some problems with reliability, but it's not completely unreliable. So let's now move on. That's, that's money for you um, and some of the challenges. Let's now move on to well-being and life satisfaction. And these are just some references that might be relevant if you're interested to follow up. Okay, willingness to pay and well-being valuation. 
Willingness to pay, if you try to describe it in more theoretical terms, willingness to pay essentially focuses on expected utility. Well-being is, is a different approach. Well-being um, emphasizes people's experience of a condition. So an example of a well-being question in general is, um, all things considered, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with life, your life overall, using a scale one to seven? Now, if somebody stopped me in the street and asked me this, I think I would burst out laughing. But this is genuinely, this is probably the most common wording of the well-being question. All things considered, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with your life overall? One very dissatisfied, up to seven uh, very satisfied. Life satisfaction is seen as being a, a sort of mix of the positive and negative emotions and also some cognitive assessment of how well your life measures up to your expectations and your aspirations. There are clearly um, quite a few challenges with this sort of approach, uh, particularly this emphasis on thinking how things are going thinking about past experiences, um, you can have a, a peak end bias. Um, if people are asked to cast their mind back and make an overall view about how things went or didn't go, sometimes we'll just focus on the peaks. Or some evidence, it's what happened last matters. There's some very famous studies <clears throat> conducted during labor, before, during and after labor with women and it's trying to investigate their um, attitude and interest in pain relief. And uh, as you ask the question at different points, you get different answers, for one thing. Um, maybe at, at the start, pe people might be saying, no, I'm not too interested. And then, of course, into labor and pain relief becomes a bit more interesting. And then, of course, after the event, they then think, well, uh, well, it wasn't so bad. They, they think about the, the end of it all, and it was sort of okay. And the bit in the middle, which was a bit awful, kind of doesn't feature. So that's a bit of a problem. As we start, any measure that's beginning to focus on people's experience, in some ways, there's a sort of unreliability can, can creep in. Uh, another issue is what's labeled here as context effects. And, and studies have shown just how important your current mood is. So if you're asked about, so how are things going? You know, how have the last three months been for you? If you catch someone in a sort of good mood, it's all, yeah, it was fine, yeah, it's good. Catch them in a bad day, it's the same last three months they experienced, but they just got a different uh, way of describing it, an attitude towards it. Uh, another problem, another challenge with asking about life satisfaction is that for many people, the, there's a sort of socially desirable answer. If people ask you, you know, how satisfied are you with your life? It doesn't really, the first thing that comes to mind is, or isn't, or I'm, actually, I'm really dissatisfied and I want to tell you about it. That doesn't sort of, you come across the wrong individual wrong sort of individual, it's much more likely that you, if you're very dissatisfied, you'll be a bit more neutral, or you might even go beyond neutral. You might be a, a little bit positive in your statement. And it's because uh, there's a social expectation that it's, it's good to be satisfied, it's bad to be dissatisfied. I want to project good, I don't project bad. This is very cultural. Ah, yes, not all cultures, yes, yeah. You give an example? Well, in Japan, it's better not to be more satisfied than the person next to you. True. This is also a Swedish thing. Yes. Yeah. You come back from vacation, how was it? You dare not say it was wonderful, because no one else is going on vacation. You say it was a lot of work, and a lot of trouble, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> then nobody else is jealous. Okay. So in different cultures, the direction could be quite different, but the kind of phenomenon that there's a social pressure 
to respond in a particular way um, is, is there, yeah. On the other hand, I mean, so these are definitely potential challenges, but if we are focusing on life satisfaction, there's clearly advantages as well. If the sort of questions that enabled us to score things were as simple as this question, collecting data is just su such a low cost activity. Uh, could we not just do it on the sent SMS messages and um, you know, we, you've collected your data in an afternoon. So it could be quite cost effective in terms of data collection. Uh, wide application, you know, it's a sort of, it's everything, life satisfaction. So um, that's good. Some proponents would argue fewer biases than the alternatives. I think the jury might be out on that one. Here's an actual study. Um, the proponents, uh, I think the authors are on the next slide. Um, uh, maybe not, I hope I've credited them somewhere. Um, I think it was Paul Dolan. Uh, he or they had a hypothesis that the sorts of things that get weighted highly in a health scale, um, for example, EQ5D, are different from the sorts of elements that will have a high weighting if we use life satisfaction or a, a sort of day equivalent. Um, and he or they have used this to argue, therefore, the EQ5D is where it's wrong, and it's the life satisfaction and day effect that's right. And so they, to, to do this, they had data, well, it was the data that was collected in, in the United States um, valuing the EQ5D using time trade-off. Uh, they then, from a, another study, had um, almost 1,200 respondents who were asked life satisfaction and day effect questions, and then they tried to understand why people gave high or low answers. And so what they found was, well, these are the questions, life satisfaction, overall, how satisfied are you with life? Um, scored in a scale zero to six, then rescaled zero to one, to make it a little bit more like an EQ5D, which of course is zero to one. And they also had uh, the day effect question. It's a little bit more complicated. Overall, how did you feel yesterday? Please rate each feeling on the scale given. A zero means you didn't experience the feeling at all. A six means you experienced that feeling very strongly. And then you're asked about these, um, friendly, lethargic, stressed, happy, sad, calm, angry, tired, depressed, worried. And uh, the, the score for day effect is the difference between the average of the positives uh, and the average of the negatives. So uh, I could ask you just to check you're paying attention which are the positives, but uh, I, I won't. Um, there are a lot more negatives than positives. There are a lot more negatives, but they're using the average. So the average positive. So you've got an average score for friendly, happy, calm. Yes, that's it. And you've got uh, an average score, lethargic, stressed, sad, angry, tired, depressed, worried. And then you look at the difference between the average positive and the average negative. So in principle, if things were just wonderful, you could have a score of um, six. That's if you scored all sixes for, for friendly, happy, etc., and all zeros for lethargic, angry, etc., and, and uh, the other way around. You could have a minus six score. And so that, that raw data, as it were, is then rescaled to zero to one as well. So zero uh, being sort of bad end of things, one being the good end of things. And so, uh, then the precise numbers don't matter here, so don't worry about the size of it. Um, so the first column is taking these EQ5D time trade-off scores and trying to explain them in terms of the different dimensions. The second column 
is taking the life satisfaction, you know, overall how satisfied are you with life, and trying to explain it using the same dimensions. Um, and then the day effect, doing the same thing. And so what they found was quite interesting. Uh, in the EQ5D, things like mobility are really quite important. But having no effect on life satisfaction or this day effect score. Um, Self-care is quite important for EQ5D, but no effect, life satisfaction or day effect. Um, a bit more, as it were, agreement when we get to things like um, usual activity, a little bit, but pain and anxiety and depression. Uh, it features in EQ5D and features strongly in life satisfaction and day effect. Um, and so this is used as evidence that um, using things like life satisfaction is going to pick up something different from what you pick up with an EQ5D. And more than being different, these authors would argue the life satisfaction is the sort of more correct, whereas EQ5D is less correct. But how you can, well, you can argue it, but how you can make your case is not so obvious. But let's just say that it does suggest life satisfaction or day effect is probably tapping into something different from what you'll pick up with a, a preference-based genetic measure such as EQ5D. And to mostly the sense of convergence research would suggest that some of this life satisfaction stuff is programmed into us by the time we're 20 years old and it's not adjustable by medical health yeah, interventions. Yeah. So you're, when you look at life satisfaction, you're looking at attitudes towards your situation rather than the health situation. Right, which could then cause a bit of a problem if you're going to measure changes in life satisfaction in apparent response to healthcare intervention because you're not going to get much change. Uh, yeah, so potentially some challenge there. Now, I think this is my last equation. <laughs> Yesterday, those of you who are here, far too many equations. This is quite an interesting equation, and it's not so very complicated. Life satisfaction is the dependent variable that we're trying to explain. It depends on a constant. It depends on income. Don't ask me why economists have always used M to measure income. <laughs> it depends on Q. This could be some non-marketed good that you consume. Uh, and particularly in our case, it could be something to do with your health. And it could also depend on various individual characteristics and then as an error term. So life satisfaction being explained basically by your income, the non-market good that we're interested in, which may be health or health related, and then your individual characteristics. Now, the, the interesting twist here is to recognize that you could, in principle, give people money, but a poorer health state. And you could, you could, they might trade off um, the two. This is what we had with our willingness to pay study. We were having, when we talked about willingness to pay earlier on, the question was, um, how much would you be willing to pay um, in order to get a particular health benefit? And so you'd be giving up money in order to get benefit. Well, same idea could happen here. So if we compare the two sides of this equation, there's life satisfaction given a particular income, given a particular level, Q1, of the non-marketed good and given your personal characteristics. There's a life satisfaction here where same income, but um, some pay payment here. So you're going to reduce your income. A different level of the non-marketed good, of course, your same characteristics. And so the life satisfaction in the two cases has been set equal. And in that case, if we rearrange everything, the willingness to pay is this coefficient, beta 2, times the difference in the non-marketed good divided by beta 1. Now, that's um, maybe sort of gobbledygook. It's just the way economists think. But the point is, um, if you can ask, if you can 
associate different levels of life satisfaction with the presence or absence of different diseases. And if you control for income, if you control for people's other characteristics, you can get this, um, this uh, trade-off. How does that relate to the East Roman paradox? You know, the East Roman paradox that the more people, the more income people have, it's the less it adds to their happiness. Yeah. And this looks like a linear addition. Yeah. But I, I'm more familiar with Eastland in a sort of um, relative, relative income hypothesis that how, how you feel is not so much how much you have, but how you compare to other people. And so if you have um, more than other people, you're better off. Um, well, this is, as it were, being done f for the individual. And so the individual's having to compare themselves. Um, this suggests that if you yeah. have more income and you have more, you have standard individual characteristics, yeah. that doesn't change per person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's standard error. Then the major factors are going to be my income and my non marketing good, which is presumably my health. Yes, it's health. It's, the, for example, presence of diabetes or absence sure. of diabetes. So if we increase my income, I should be more satisfied. And in principle, if my health has changed, you could cut. Yes, yes. But you could compensate me, as it were. If you give me money and diabetes, I can be left as well off as I was originally. And then the issue is, well, how much money would we have to give you to compensate you for the diabetes? Uh, obviously, yes, again, that's, the, that's the game we're playing. Uh, right? Yeah, right. yeah. So if we look at the results that came out of this. Essentially, how much extra money is required to compensate an average person for having a particular health problem, we get some interesting values here. Um, some of them quite low, well, in a sense, low, seven, six, five. All figures are in thousand pounds per annum. So this is implying that given the people they sampled, the average person, um, for example, would be willing to, to um, would need six thousand pounds a year to compensate them for difficulty in hearing, as opposed to no difficulty, or diabetes. Indeed, six thousand again. Um, the average person, if you gave them six thousand pounds and diabetes, would be as well off as no diabetes and not the six thousand. Depression, £455,000 per year. I like that figure. <laughs> yeah, it's quite attractive. I think I would be willing to be depressed. Well, actually, if you were that depressed, you probably, the money wouldn't help. £8 million for a drug addiction? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you, you would need the money to feed the habit. Uh, yeah. Personally, I think these numbers are all over the place. I think some of the sort of smaller numbers, yeah, might be all right. But I only introduce this as an example of how life satisfaction has been used. Uh, it's been used to derive a monetary valuation. These are all hypotheticals to healthy people asking them to imagine. Yeah. And to I, actually, I've only worked with terminal patients. And if you ask healthy people to imagine a terminal state, and compare that with what terminal patients yeah. really say, it's totally skewed. Yeah. So we really need to ask drug addicts and depressed people and people with uh, hard of hearing and compare this to healthy people to get any reasonable yeah. reading. Yeah. Well, that's what the Swedish study did with regard to EQ5D. Right. And I would argue that's the only reliable index of EQ5D because mm. all the others are imaginary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the usual answer that's given to that, or counterpoint given to that, is um, many of us have not experienced that health state, but we do know perhaps what pain is. We do know um, what, we understand what mobility is. We understand about self-care. Uh, we may have had family members who've experienced these 
um, health states. And so it's hypothetical for us, but we can still understand it or imagine it. Um, whether we buy that or not, I don't know. Do you know what Susan Gould at the University of Michigan? Mm -hmm. She was asking African Americans in Detroit about health choices which they hadn't experienced. And her answers like these were all in the marketplace. So she invited people in winter to gymnasia of schools that were empty and gave them free uh, tea or coffee and popcorn, cheap, but they could be warm and they could play a game, like a, a monopoly game or a life game. And in this game, they would break limbs, they would have babies, they would get hospitalized for different things. Um, and they would see how much it would cost them if they were hospitalized or if they had a baby, mm. and how much they would lose from their collective savings and so on. After a month or two of playing these life games every couple of days uh, to get out of the cold in Detroit, people made much more realistic decisions because they had been primed to realize how expensive and painful various situations had been. If you just ask them to imagine, their imagination is all over the waterfront. Yeah. But if you prime them by giving them some education, mm. like your anime for mm. the uh, four-year-olds, mm. or Susan Gould's game of life mm. for diabetes and having a baby and whatever, I think it's much more accurate. Right. Yeah, I, I'm definitely, I mean, what's sometimes been used in getting health state valuations is to try and give more information about the health state. Uh, one example, before I move on, was with respect to restricted vision. And so they got people to wear special goggles, which restricted your vision, similar to a patient, for example, the cataract might experience. And uh, you can see the idea, but of course there is a difference between having the goggles on for an afternoon and that's how you live your life. But I, I take the point, um, and it relates to the other point, that um, can people who haven't experienced something, can they give meaningful valuations? Uh, so it's definitely an issue there. Okay, um, I'm need to, I need to wrap up actually, I think, shortly. Um, one more study. Um, there's something called the HODAR or, um, data set, Hospital Outcomes Data Repository. There's a hospital in Wales, um, in Cardiff, um, which routinely for a number of years has got the patients to fill in an EQ EQ5D when they're admitted and when they're discharged. And also, I think about six months follow-up. So they've just been collecting EQ5D repeatedly on their patients. And so using this data set, um, this study um, wanted to try and investigate uh, to what extent um, there was a relationship with um, self-reported happiness. So they had this EQ5D and some SF6D data and they want to um, regress self-reported happiness on these things. And so what's driving um, self-reported happiness? Now, of course, there's um, a few challenges. Uh, the EQ5D, as we've seen, asks people about their health today. You know, how, which statement best describes how you feel today? Uh, SF60 asks about your physical functioning on a typical day. So some sort of average over time. And some other items in the SF6D explicitly refer to the past four weeks. So you have to bear in mind they're asking different question about a different time period. The happiness question, have you been happy, refers to the past four weeks. And so you have to bear that in mind. And then in response to the happiness question, the respondents choose uh, the answers none of the time, a little of the time, some, most, or all. And so what they, um, this is the results for the um, EQ5D3L. And so they've taken people's self-reported happiness over the past four weeks, and they're trying to explain it using the information they provided on EQ5D, you know, which 
mobility level are you at, which self-care level, etc. And so um, these things here, these odds ratios, really should all be under one, because the idea is the poorer health is uh, reducing your uh, self-reported happiness. And more than that, the, as you move to a poorer level of mobility or a poorer level of self-care, usual activities, uh, the odds ratio should be falling. And by and large it is. I mean, okay, this value is above just, just over one, but the value is tending to fall as we go between these pairs of um, levels. If we do the same thing for the SF6D, we've got physical functioning just not performing well at all. All these values should be less than one. They should be reducing uh, your self-reported happiness. More than that, the poorer levels of physical functioning are getting higher scores, not lower scores. So there's something slightly strange going on. According to the SF6D, the poorer your physical functioning, the more likely you are to be happier. Um, other ones that are behaving a bit better, if we look at, for example, pain, they're below one. Um, and they're, well, they're not quite a right pattern, but they're tending to decline. And so it's behaving a bit better. Social functioning is behaving as we predict. Mental health is behaving as we predict. And vitality is behaving as we predict. Um, so it, how, what would we conclude? There does seem to be a bit of a relationship between these health measures and happiness, but not nearly as clear cut as we might anticipate. Although you could say the EQ5D is kind of behaving, but SF6D not really. Interestingly, the authors kind of say both aren't behaving. I say interestingly because the author here, Brazier, developed the 6D. <laughs> um, but anyway, right, um, yeah. This is another study which does suggest that the EQ5D3L, which has this strong emphasis on mobility, is maybe um, a little bit at odds with other information we've got that suggests mental health is a bit more important. Um, and just, just to close almost, it's quite interesting that the new valuation for the EQ5D5L from England does find mental health to be rather more important than it was in the past. But anyway, let's try and draw some conclusions. Right, money first of all, Clearly, there's some advantages in using money. Money is a way of measuring strength of preference. Um, it's a way of valuing attributes beyond health. It means that you've already measured your benefit in the same terms as you measured costs. So that helps. Everything's money, money, money. We don't have to worry about how much should we be willing to pay for a health benefit. It also means you can compare what's going on in different sectors beyond health. But clearly challenges. Um, it's still stated preference. It's not revealed preference. So there's an issue about validity. Different methods give different answers. So there's a question about what is the best method to use in which circumstances. There's been, I'm just giving you a very selective run through the literature, but there's been a certain amount of interest in recent years in well-being valuation. Uh, it's not been restricted to the health sector. People in general have been talking about well-being as a means to judge between policies, for example. Uh, the well-being approach, the life satisfaction approach, I think shares some of the advantages that willingness to pay does. 
it maybe has potential wide application. But like willingness to pay, I think it's, there's no sign that well-being or life satisfaction is going to supplant the quality in the near future. Uh, the quality, despite its problems and challenges, has really quite a substantial body of research behind it. The well-being research, um, life satisfaction research, by contrast, is a bit more in its infancy, and we, we know a bit less. And so, um, in summary, for these alternatives to the quality, I don't see things changing much in the near future, but they've each got some merit. I don't think, I think it's too early to write them off. Having said that, willingness to pay for health benefits has been around for several decades. And so if it was really going to break through, you think it might have happened by now. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much and we resume on Friday.